welcome back to another episode of Rednecks Rising. I'm your host, Chelsea, and this is the podcast all about the evolution of revolution in Appalachia. Each week, I switch between digging into historical topics related to the Appalachian Mountains with all the rich multiracial organizing that has taken place, and interviewing the coolest hillbilly hellraisers that called us place their home and are doing good work across the mountain range today. This is our third episode. We just launched on June 14th, and if you haven't listened to the first episodes, I might be biased, but I would encourage you to go back and do just that. There were two episodes that dropped that day, and we got over 100 listens on day one, y'all. That's wild. And I like literally got chills right now just from thinking about all the support and the connection that I feel after launching this podcast. There was so much good p- feedback, messages that folks shared with me that they got emotional when they heard genuine Appalachian media that didn't depend on tropes or caricatures. Folks saying that they felt that we managed to keep this incredibly accessible while also historically rich. And folks that reached out from across the region who were excited to come onto the show and talk about specific pieces of our people's history or share the good work that they're doing on the ground. And that's exactly what this is all about. So I'm so excited. Uh, Really love hearing from y'all. So please keep sharing your feedback. Speaking of support, we have had some additional supporters jump over to our Ko-Fi to throw down for the podcast, and I appreciate y'all so much, and one of the perks of throwing down in our uh, Ko-Fi either once or becoming a monthly contributor, regardless of whichever it is, is that you get a shout out on our show and on our social media, so Today, I would like to shout out our friends Tweeds, who's a friend of ours out here in Western North Carolina, and I appreciate you so much, longtime supporter. Uh, Jessa Ray, who I believe I saw maybe hop over to the Discord, but um, we're just looking forward to talking to you more and bringing you into the community. We've got our friend who, I don't know if you prefer to go by your first or middle name, so we've got Robert Caleb. Thank you so much for your support, Robert Caleb. Our friend Melinda, you're the bomb, Melinda. Thanks for supporting the show. My friend Artie, who is from uh, Project Embodied Welcome, which has just recently launched their own podcast in honor of Pride Month, which is called the PewCast, stands for Project Embodied Welcome. And I really hope to be able to interview Artie on our show because they are just doing amazing work in the queer community all throughout North Carolina, as well as the faith community and you should definitely hop over and give their podcast a listen to if you get a chance. And then last but certainly not least, my comrade Ryan Jay, who's done some phenomenal work out here in Western North Carolina uh, advocating for health care and all kinds of good stuff. And uh, we appreciate you so much. Your support makes all the difference in the world. And in addition to shouting out these folks, I did want to mention that we are trying to build out our Discord community, and we want you to be a part of the conversation over there on Discord. So folks that are featured on the show in our guest episodes will be added to the Discord automatically when their episode drops, if they're into that kind of thing. And the other way to join the Discord is to become a monthly contributor over on our Ko-Fi page, kind of like uh, Ko-Fi is kind of like a Patreon and monthly contributions on our page start as low as $1 per month, which gets you access to that Discord and gets you a shout out on the show like the folks you just heard about. And in addition to that, each other level comes with sweet perks like the aforementioned Discord, access to unique merch. I am planning to send some stickers to some folks and even casting a vote on future episode topics because, you know, around here we believe in letting the people make decisions for themselves, if you know what I mean. So the last thing I want to say before I jump right in is that you can also support the podcast by purchasing merch from our Ko-Fi. Right now we have some limited edition launch t-shirts as well as some Redneck Pride t-shirts, both of which will be available until the end of this month. So if you're listening and it's June and you want one, head on over before July comes around and you miss your chance. 
regardless of whether funds come in from merch, monthly memberships, one-off donations, or what have you, one half of all the income that's brought in from the show supporters will be donated to an organization that's doing radical work to build solidarity and bring our community closer together across Appalachia. And the rest of that is going to help me pay for the cost of maintaining this podcast because surprisingly podcasting is not free. Uh, So, you know, the rest of that helps me cover the monthly publishing fee for the Spreaker publishing platform. It covers the tech to make the show sound halfway decent and so on. Half the funds that come in through the end of June will be donated towards the Pulaski County Free Store. And like I mentioned, those are the folks that we interviewed in the second episode. So if you have not listened to that, go back and check it out because Zoo just really hit home sharing her personal story. She spoke some real truth about Appalachia and demonstrated what it looks like to turn words into action when it comes to mutual aid, community care, and community organizing. I'll let y'all know how much we're able to bring in and how much of that goes to the PC free store when the end of the month rolls around. So stay tuned. I believe that about wraps up all of my housekeeping business for today. So I think we can get into the good stuff now. So for today's episode, full context, I actually started out by doing research, planning to cover the Battle of Blair Mountain, but My ADHD is such that that led me to doing research on historical labor uprisings that had happened in the century before the Battle on Blair Mountain, which then led me to learning about multiracial organizing by indentured servants prior to the formalization of the Virginia Slave Codes, which then led me all the way back to colonial America and the introduction of race on this continent and suddenly I was in a rabbit hole begetting another rabbit hole begetting another rabbit hole. So I thought I needed to start at the beginning for myself and probably, you know, it might be helpful for some of y'all listening out there because there is a whole lot of history that hasn't been covered in our public education curriculum, at least not that was covered in the public education that I received. And I am uncovering a lot of this for myself for the very first time. And I feel like a lot of it just offers context. It's pretty important to understanding the big picture of where we are today in Appalachia, but also beyond. So given that context for today's episode, we are starting all the way back at the story of the Lost Colony. Well, actually, 20 years after the Lost Colony disappeared in 1607, when the English attempted to establish another colony 150 miles up the coast at Jamestown. I want to be really clear that this colony was literally established as a means of making money for English royalty and wealthy shareholders who invested in this colonization venture. The Virginia Company of London's goals were very straightforward. Bring settlers to Virginia and return a profit for wealthy shareholders back in England. So let's just highlight, like, The whole reason our country was ever colonized to start with was to make money for folks back in England who weren't even here. And I am sure that there are folks of color out there or folks who are just more attuned or maybe had more access to accurate historical information that are like, well, duh, Chelsea, this was always clear. But for me, you know, I've always had like these gut feelings, but this had never really clicked until I started researching all of this for this podcast. So wealthy people over in Europe paid to send the like upper middle class ish, we'll call them like the planter class. They're like ownership class to come claim and colonize unfamiliar land 
solely for the purpose of making more money for those already wealthy people over in Europe. I also want to pause and give a disclaimer. (laughs) I am not a historian, and I am sure that there are some folks with a very large extent of experience and knowledge about history and or political theory who are going to end up listening to this podcast and being like, Lord, this girl does not know what she is talking about. But that's not really the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast is to explore the real lived experiences and new perspectives around history regarding Appalachian folks. And I come into all of this with a background in social work, like human behavior, community organizing type social work and social policy stuff. But I've never actually been very good at history. And I think part of that is because I was being pitched this like really shitty, boring, whitewashed version of history that wasn't fun to learn about. But I'm learning a lot of this for the very first time. And if any of this is incorrect, please give me feedback. Let me know I'm wrong. I want to have you on the show if you know more than me about this stuff so that you can give more accurate information. I do the best I can to research this stuff with the resources that my public library and a couple of other folks have to offer, but that doesn't mean that I always cover everything comprehensively or even uh, in a way that some folks will agree with. So I want your feedback. Let me know. But I just wanted to give that disclaimer. That said, I also just want to make the connection here back to episode one and the reason we chose the name for this show and the whole long history behind the word redneck and how it was introduced as one of the many tools to maintain wealth in this country and how that tool was deployed as part of a thick thick history that dates back to the very foundations of this country being colonized as a means of producing wealth for the European elite. So this thread of us being used as a means of making profit for others is a thread that I am going to come back to and that I'm going to keep pulling through our episodes because it's important, at least to me, that we follow along with what appears to be a super intentional, super coordinated legacy of these mega rich elite doing whatever possible to make more and more and more for themselves, despite any cost that it might have to the rest of us and our children and our planet and our sense of connection and well-being. All right, so all of that said, we've got this Virginia company sent in 20 years after the lost colony in the first decade of the 1600s, but the problem was that all of their first attempts at industry creation from the colonizers were way too labor-intensive to be profitable. Or they required conditions that really weren't available in this whole new continent. The soil was different. The climate wasn't something that they were used to and so on. And not to mention, you know, just like the earlier lost colony, the Virginia company faced difficulties like food shortages, unfamiliar diseases, and conflict with all of the indigenous peoples who the colonizers were attempting to displace. But unlike the lost colony, the Virginia company survived long enough to find a cash crop, tobacco, around 1612. The thing about tobacco is that it is not an easy crop to manage. It requires a ton of labor and it is really hard on the land. And that means that in order to turn a profit, which remember, the whole point of colonizing this land, the sole purpose behind the Virginia company 
was creating a profit for their investors. So if they were going to rely on tobacco for that profit, planters needed a really large amount of labor and land. At first, because there was so much labor required to maintain the crops, there weren't nearly enough people to work enough tobacco to turn around a decent profit. So this brings us to around 1620 or so when the planters decided to experiment with buying slaves from Africa, but at that point it was just a little too expensive for them considering that their whole mission was making a profit for these wealthy folks back in Europe, so it just didn't make economic sense, and instead they turned to English indentured labor. The English economy at this point in time was going through a pretty severe decline, and there were a lot of poor working folks that were desperate for a means of surviving and, you know, Lord forbid, even making a life for themselves, and these folks would agree to indentured servitude. And what this agreement for indentured servants looked like was typically four to seven years of labor in exchange for passage across the ocean. And then they would get food and shelter during their agreement period, however long their contract was. And usually once their contract was up, if they had fulfilled it, then they would also receive food and tools and like 50 acres of land or so along with their freedom so that they could start their free life. So given that a lot of these poor indentured immigrants would never be able to dream of owning their own land back in Europe, this was a pretty good deal, even though it was definitely a gamble because a lot of folks died before they were ever able to fulfill their contract because, as you can imagine, the living conditions in the colony were horrible. We already talked about food shortages, unfamiliar diseases, and all of the conflict that was created by the colonization. So at this point, we're in the early 17th century, and the ideas of race in America were less defined. Indentured servants from Europe were often immigrating from all over the continent, coming from a variety of cultures and languages, and African slaves, much like indentured servants from what I read at the time, and I hope someone will correct me if I'm wrong, at that point in time in the early 17th century, they were also bound for a defined specific period of time after which they would gain their freedom. And I'm going to drop the sources that I used for this episode in the show notes um, so that folks can let me know if I have come incorrect in any way. So these indentured servants, these workers often came together across race lines to organize or run away and try to find some kind of relief from the grueling labor and difficult working conditions that they were being exposed to. And so in July 1640, still in the first half of this 17th century, we see the first documented legal distinction made between Europeans and Africans in regards to laborers. It was in a case that appeared in front of the colony's judges, which described three servants belonging to Hugh Gwynn, who uh, these three servants ran away to Maryland and were captured there. There was Victor, a Dutchman, and James Gregory, a Scotchman, And both of those men were each sentenced to be whipped, and they received four years added on to the length of their contract. The third servant was described as a black man named John Punch, and this man was punished differently. Rather than take on additional years to his servitude, he was made a slave for life. So now it is at this point that I would like to invite us to collectively, if you are listening, participate in some critical thinking and curiosity. Let's explore why 
those who were in positions of decision-making power would want to legally enforce different punishments between white and black indentured servants and slaves. The question that I like to always ask for myself is who benefits from this happening? Could it possibly be in this situation that they needed to give white servants a reason not to work with black servants by scaring them away from losing their potential freedom? Could it be that understanding that there were more collectively white and black folks working than there were landowners, could it be that the landowners also saw that black and white folks working together not only were dangerous because of their combined numbers, but were also threatening because ultimately black slaves had less to lose if caught, given that freedom was less accessible. So they might be a bad influence, right? I'm not accusing anything here or, you know, entertaining conspiracy theories. I'm just inviting us to think critically and get curious. So now we're moving into the second half of the 1600s into the 1660s, during which a um, general assembly session took place where the lawmakers of Virginia addressed the circumstances of, quote, English running away with black folks, end quote. They decided at this point to leverage that pressure that could be exerted on white servants who still had some chance at freedom. And they decided to do that by enforcing a law that added time to the punishment of white servants for every black worker that they conspired with if they were caught running away. So comparing this back to the previous case where we had the first documented difference in punishment between white and black workers, this would look like if a white worker was caught running away with a black worker Instead of getting a four-year extension on their indentured servitude, they would get four plus another however many years for each of the black workers that were caught to be running away with them. So if it was four years per worker, then it would be this white worker would be at risk of instead of just getting four years added on, it would be 12 years if they were caught with just two other black workers. Now, I'm a very like big picture type of person, so I need to think about the context of everything that's kind of happening at once. And so during the same time frame, the presence of slavery in general was expanding gradually as the English empire was growing. And the English empire's role in the slave trade was maturing. And so enslaved Africans became more available throughout Virginia at the same time that these like very intentional punitive consequences are being made for European workers to create a distinction between European workers and African workers and black workers. So the wealthy land-owning class started to realize at this point a few decades had passed and conditions were different and they could make a large profit margin for investing in slaves instead of indentured servitude. Since slaves lasted the entire lifetime of the human being, as opposed to indentured servitude agreements being a limited time contract, they were temporary, right? So they weren't as profitable profitable of 
an investment in the long run. And you're going to get sick of me saying this, but remember the whole reason they were colonizing to start with was to make a profit. And again, looking big picture during this same time frame of the decade of the 1960s, we start to see folks banding together to protest the horrible conditions and treatment that they received as workers. In 1961, 40 servants in York County got fired up around their masters not feeding them enough and attempted to organize a rebellion. And then again, two years later, a group of nine indentured servants in Gloucester County made a plan to arm themselves and march to the governor's house where they intended to demand their freedom. Now, neither of these efforts were successful, but they did help lead us into the night or sorry, the 1670s when slaves really started to significantly replace white indentured servants in larger numbers among the working class in Virginia and when Bacon's Rebellion took place. So, 1676, a guy named Nathaniel Bacon led a rebellion against the colonial government. And a large part of this rebellion was fueled by fear and hatred of the indigenous peoples. And so... I really want to acknowledge that the events that took place during Bacon's Rebellion are a direct result of white supremacist, capitalist colonialism and violence towards slash the displacement of indigenous communities. And At the core of Bacon's Rebellion, there was an irreconcilable tension between the indentured servants that had immigrated into the Virginia Company and the indigenous communities whose lands and lives were being infiltrated and violated. And that said, I also want to explore this story a little more deeply to address the underlying foundation of the issue in profit-driven social structures and caste systems. When we look at the rebellion from the perspective of the Virginia working class colonial society, Bacon's Rebellion was simply bringing to a head problems that had been brewing for a really long time. There was this book that was published in the first decade of the 1700s that recounts three reasons for the rebellion. Quote, first, the extreme low price of tobacco and the ill usage of the planters in the exchange of goods for it, which the country with all their earnest endeavors could not remedy. Secondly, the splitting of the colony into proprieties contrary to the original charters and the extravagant taxes they were forced to undergo to relieve themselves from those grants. And thirdly, the heavy restraints and burdens laid upon their trade by the Act of Parliament in England, end quote. A.K.A. folks were sick of the falling prices of tobacco, combined with increasing taxes and the fact that the land was being given away to wealthy individuals against the agreement that had been made, which meant that the colonies couldn't sell it to help them cover the costs. And the... Bacon's Rebellion all started with a local dispute that the Virginian colonizers had with the Doeg Indians on the Potomac River. Virginia militiamen responded to the dispute that was taking place 
by chasing these indigenous peoples north, where then a raid took place on the Virginia frontier. And the colonial government wanted to respond one way, the locals wanted to respond another way, and all of these other underlying tensions that were mentioned in the paper that I quoted came to a head. So the locals turned to Nathaniel Bacon, who was a recent arrival to Virginia and also a member of the governor's council. So all of this culminated in a civil war that pit Bacon's followers against the loyalists to the governor, and eventually the governor was chased out of town and the capital was burned down by Bacon's army just before Bacon's unexpected death and just before the English crown sent a dispatch of troops to the area to quell the rebellion. So this Nathaniel Bacon fella, he was not a member of the working class. I just want to make that clear. He was a member of this elite leadership. He served on the governor's council, and he was actually one of the richest men in the colony. But his followers, Bacon's army, if you will, included large numbers of disaffected servants that were both black and white. And again, that's because most of this actually goes back to the way that the workers were being treated and the inadequate profit-driven leadership. So that said, after Bacon's Rebellion, the planter elite, this wealthy ownership class, were like, oh shit, we can't risk black and white working folks coming together like this because they outnumber us by far. And if they realize that, then we're doomed. We don't stand a chance. So, of course, they had to, at this point, consolidate their power after Bacon's Rebellion and consolidate their control over the colony. So, who loses when the rich and powerful consolidate their control and power? Well, of course, it's the working class that loses. It's the the little guy. So the losers in this struggle tended to, to be the folks who were newer to the colony, who hadn't been there as long, and who may have held some resentment around the power and privileges of these established elite. And those who gained from this consolidation of power and control were this older class of wealth that had helped to found the colony a few decades earlier, or royalists who had fled to Virginia in the mid-1600s following the English Civil Wars. Does this sound familiar? The elite, wealthy ownership class, ownering (laughs) ownership class, working to consolidate their power and protect their wealth and using their wealth and using their power and their privilege to do that and assert their control over the rest of us in a way that ultimately benefits those who have this level of proximity to power and wealth. So the lawmakers of Virginia at this point in time, as we're nearing the end of the 17th century, after Bacon's Rebellion, when all of these working class indentured servants and African slaves had come together essentially and taken up arms against the colonial government. After this happens, the lawmakers of Virginia begin to pass laws that define much more rigid distinctions between white and non-white working folks and free and slave. Some, like, historians and academics argue that Bacon's Rebellion forced the elite landowners of Virginia to recognize the danger of having such a large number of 
unhappy, angry, working class folks in their midst, which was then addressed by the elite powerful of Virginia by relying more on the labor of slaves because they considered slaves to be safer due to being like less likely to become free and ultimately take up arms against the colony. And then other like academic historian folks have suggested that the move towards slave labor is actually more linked to economic profit um, rather than social causes and has to do with the price and availability of enslaved human beings. And, you know, probably it was like a combination of all of these things that led to the legislation and the formal policy that was passed at the beginning of the 1700s. But regardless, at this point, we see a Virginia that has been pumped and primed for racial animosity among working class white folks and working class folks of color and the indigenous peoples of the land. This Nathaniel Bacon fella essentially took advantage of the economic rage and anger that folks were feeling within the colony to take action against the indigenous peoples of the land. And then we've got the Virginia ruling class trying to create animosity between white and black working folks by using punishment and legislation and whatever means they have. And this gap between the elite ruling class of planters and the working class servants and slaves is widening significantly. By the beginning of the 18th century, the 1700s, Virginia was being fully run by this elite ruling, land-owning planter class. And the fate becomes sealed for our Black members of the working class with what we know as the Virginia Slave Codes in 1705. It was the Virginia Slave Codes that first referred to human beings, specifically African slaves, as real estate and freed slave owners from any responsibility or consequences related to the harm that they might cause as a result of punishments they inflicted on that real estate, which was their quote-unquote property under this law, for the purpose of exerting their power or control over that property. The Virginia Slave Codes not only made it acceptable but also imposed harsh physical punishments on enslaved persons since they couldn't own property and couldn't be required to pay fines. The Virginia Slave Codes stated that slaves needed written permission to leave their plantation and that slaves found guilty of murder or rape would be hanged, and that for robbing or any other similar major offense, slaves would receive 60 lashes and be placed in stocks where their ears would be cut off, And for minor offenses, such as socializing with whites, 
again, we see this like intentional incentivizing of isolation and division between white and black working class folks. But so for minor offenses like socializing with whites, slaves would be whipped, branded, or maimed. And remember how I mentioned that in the 1640s was when the first documented legal distinction was made based on race among the working class for punishment of running away. That was because at that point, disputes between the working class and their masters in the elite ruling ownership class, those disputes could be brought before a court for judgment at that point in time. With the slave codes of 1705, that was no longer the case. A slave owner who sought to break the most rebellious of slaves could now do just that, knowing that whatever punishment he inflicted, even if it resulted in the death of a human being, that the slave owner themselves wouldn't face any sort of reprimands. So this has been a long historical journey, even in just one episode. And I know that I personally get overwhelmed by a lot of historical details. So I think that this is probably a good place to stop. But I want to recap. Racialized slavery rooted in the perception of specifically human beings as personal property developed among the English colonies of North America in the mid-17th century, so like the mid-1600s, and was fully institutionalized by 1700s via Virginia. And while my main focus is on Appalachian history and the labor movement here and what gave our root to our culture and involvement in that movement, I do want to highlight that slavery was practiced in the New England and Middle Colonies and Massachusetts Bay Colony actually passed the first slave law in 1641. But ultimately, Virginia pioneered the institutionalized slavery and Virginia slave laws that we are familiar with, which were adapted from English colonies in Barbados. And these institutional distinctions between race and the consequences of those distinctions became a model that the other colonies then were able to draw on when creating their own legislation. So I think that's probably a good spot for us to drop on for today. We've covered about a century (laughs) of America's history, you know, from 1607 until the Virginia slave laws, slave codes were passed in 1705. And so, you know, I think we've covered a good bit of material and I've probably butchered a lot of it. Please let me know if that is the case. And otherwise, we will pick up where we left off in a couple of weeks after we hear from our next interview episode, which will feature our friends Raf and Gina from Fire on the Mountain podcast, also based out of Western North Carolina. <laughs>
And in a couple of weeks, we will be hearing from our friends at the Chattanooga Free Store. But if there are other folks doing good work on the ground in the trenches across the Appalachian Mountains around mutual aid or community organizing or anything in between, let us know so we can hook up with them for an interview. In the meantime, you are welcome to support Rednecks Rising podcast by visiting our Ko-Fi, just spelled K-O, like knockout, hyphen, F-I dot com slash Rednecks Rising, spelled exactly like it is spelled in the title of this podcast. Facebook is the only website where we cannot spell rednecks the way that we would like to spell it. And we think that is because Facebook classifies rednecks as a hate word, which, fair enough, I guess. So anyways, ko-fi.com slash redneckrising spelled with C-K-S, not spelled with X. And that said... Lord Willard and the Creek Don't Rise. We will see y'all next week with Gina and Raph from Fire on the Mountain Podcast. And we'll be back the week after that with more historical content. If you join us on Kofi, you'll be able to vote on which topics we cover next in our historical episodes. Bye, y'all. Have a good week. <laughs>